by Brother Heng Yu on 2 Timothy. Today's scripture reading shall be taken from the second book of Timothy. You'll be reading from chapter 6, chapter 4, verse 6 to 8 and 16 to 18. Let us read together. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and that the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the heart righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Commission, please stand for the gospel reading. This morning, the gospel is taken from the 18th chapter, according to the gospel of St. Luke, beginning from verse 9. Glory to Christ, our Savior. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 to 14. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went out into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioner, unjust, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even leave out his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Please sit. Last week we saw a characteristic of God's people. God's people are marked by consistent and persevering prayer. Rather than being overcome by trust and difficulty, God's people actually persevere in prayer and the result is a stronger faith. So in general, whether it is an extreme trial or the very mundane activities like attending church services, Perseverant prayer is the answer of Jesus. And today we are going to look at two people who offer to God very different prayer. Both prayers reveal something about the hearts of this man. One man felt that he had enough righteousness within himself to be justified before God. And the other realized that he is hopelessness and place himself on the mercy of God. We may learn many things in this passage through the prayer of these two men. But the main lesson is, what does it take to be justified before God? In fact, our life as a Christian depends on the answer to this question. What does it take to be justified before God. 
One other thing to note is this. Because this parable has a Pharisee as one of its examples, please do not think that today's message is meant only for the law's legalists. In this passage, Jesus does not turn to the Pharisee and tell them a parable. He told a parable to all who hear and consider. So church, let us uh, commit this time to Lord in prayer as we look into what God is going to say uh, this morning. Father Lord God, may your word direct us to the truth so that Lord, we can stand before you justified. So Lord, we ask Lord for your presence to be with us and may your Holy Spirit guide us as we listen to your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. When I first read this passage, I asked a very fundamental question. Why did Jesus tell this parable? Jesus gave his reason in verse 9. He said this. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with content. Basically, two reasons. First, there were some in his midst who trusted in their righteousness to be justified before God. And second, these who trusted in themselves treated others with content, with hatred or disapproval. So, this leads us to ask, what does it take to be justified before God? I will not go deep into the Bible to explain justifications. Plainly, the Bible tells us that justifications is the act of making someone right with God. Justifications take place when God declares those who place their faith in Christ Jesus to be righteous. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For our sake, God made him, make Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, Jesus became our substitute on the cross so that we could be made just or make right with God. We were guilty, but God has declared us righteous. In our parable this morning, first, Jesus is warning us against looking into ourselves for justifications. Some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. We see a man here in our passage who believes he has sufficient righteousness within himself to be justified before God. And our point that Jesus made here is that while these people were trusting in themselves, they also were making the mistake of comparing themselves with others or to others and treated others with content. The attitude of someone who believes they are righteous in themselves is to look to others and stay one step ahead of them rather than seeing Christ as the model of righteousness, they often fabricate a system in their own mind and place them one step, of, one step ahead of others, always thinking that they are better. They think that they are acceptable, acceptable before God because they are not unjust, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. Please understand, my brothers and sisters, just because we can do right in a few good things about ourselves does not make us fit for heaven. Just because we are not a thief and we are fair and faithful to our wife does not make us fit for God's kingdom. Doing good things will never make us more acceptable to God than a thief 
a cheat, and an adulterer. Now, look at verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. The common practice in the temple was prayer. It was the house of prayer. Jesus preaches for us a sin to teach us about justifications. As we have learned before, the Pharisees were the religious elite of the day. They had built an elaborate system by which they sought God's approval through hard religious work. They were society model of religion. If anyone should have been justified before God, in the eyes of society, it would have been this religious Pharisee. After all, they follow the letters of the law. And in the mind of this religious leader, they have a very funny kind of mindset. They have a they and others world that kind of mindset. Those who love God and follow the letter of the law belongs to one particular world, and everyone else belongs to the other world. The other man Jesus mentioned is the tax collector. Tax collector were famous for their thievery and the fact that they had sold out their homeland to Rome. And being employed by the Romans and Paul, the Jews hated them. They were considered uh, sinners, ruthless, and immoral. And in the mind of the people, they would think that they could not get much worse than a tax collector. So, if there's anyone who should not be justified, surely it would be this rotten, sinful tax collector. Is it possible for a deeply religious person to be lost and a repentant sinner to be saved? Luke, in this passage, purposefully set up a dilemma for us to think. Who would be a candidate for justifications? A religious leader who conforms to the letter of the law or a dirty, low-life tax collector? To get a clue, right, let us examine the prayer. A prayer can say a lot about the person. Look at verses 11 and 12. It says, the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortional, unjust, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give thanks of all that I get. At the first glance, we might be tempted to think that this text does not apply to us, or we might show our self-righteousness by thanking God that we are not like this Pharisee. However, a deeper look reveals that this text may actually hit us right in our face. The Pharisee has some good theology. In fact, the theology is fantastic here, right? if you really study carefully. He did not believe that he could acquire this good, God-honoring characteristic apart from God. In this regard, he was reformed in his view of God. He was orthodox in the sense of understanding that if there was anything good accomplished in his sinful heart, it was a work of God. We would affirm this. So the Pharisee thanked God for the work that had been done in his life. He thanked God that he was not a thief or that he did not uh, cheat people. He thanked God that he was not an adulterer. He was faithful to his wife. All of these are good 
God-honoring characteristic. And he thanked God for them. God had worked morality in his life. So, what is the problem? God had worked religiously as well as morally. In fact, he went over and above what is required of him to fast. In the normal circumstance, in the biblical time, a Jews will fast during certain festivals, such as the Day of Atonement, or he deliberately set aside time to seek God. As with Jesus, spending 40 days in the presence of God in the wilderness. But look carefully, this Pharisee fasted twice a week. See how religious he was. And not only that, he gave his tithes regularly. He was religious and he thanked God for all that as well. We have no reason to doubt any of what the Pharisee said. So, what is the problem? He was doing good things. He credited God with the ability to do them. The problem was, he trusted in himself that he was righteous. He believed that he could trust and rely on the good character traits to get him to heaven. He thought that God would be satisfied with a righteousness that he had attained. Please do not let this slip past us. It would be very similar to a Christians today trusting in their sanctifications. In other words, we must never look to ourselves as a source of our righteousness and, depending, and depend on that for salvation. It is all Christ from start to finish and nothing else. Justification comes only through Jesus Christ. Never our effort, even when we begin to see the work of Christ in our life. The work, in our, the work of Christ in our life can be like people get healed when we lay our hands over them and pray for them. People get delivered when we pray in the name of Jesus. Even to a sense that we are able to perform miracles, able to prophesy able to have a better understanding of the scripture than other, other people, drawing people to us, in fact, influencing others to do good work or even uh, do evangelism. We must never trust in that. Never trust in that work. We must never trust in that for our justifications. But always, in humanity, see that Jesus has done it all. For us in our life. And even though you know, we are more like Christ today than we were when we were first saved, we still trust in God and not in ourselves. Even I have someone has been a Christian for 60 years, that person must still in humility rely on Christ and the mercy of God. Unfortunately, I know some people, like this man in the parable, I know some people who would admit that Christ saved them, but now think that they are prettily holy and great, influential in the Christians and the church circle, and are depending on that rather than on Christ. A very clear mark of one who trusts in themselves is the mark of condemning others and treating others with contempt. Thank God I am not like other men. To think that righteousness comes through not engaging in a specific sin or that it comes as a result of doing some good things is to totally misunderstand righteousness. As crazy as this sounds, this passage shows us very clearly that not sinning does not make us righteous. A spiritually lost person can be moral. A spiritually lost person can be honest and upright all the way to hell. 
Now look at verse 13. The prayer of the tax collector, he said this, this passage tells us this, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Here in this prayer, we see a humble heart. We see one who has been broken because of sin. Notice with me, he stands far off and looks down at the ground. And he, heal, and he beats his breast in anguish over his sin. He does not come to the front and look up into the heaven. He does not thank God that he is not like others. His posture, his posture in prayer is the posture of one who is afraid of God's judgment because of sin. He is not proud and confident in himself. If this tax collector is going to even have any hope for a right standing before God, it will be because God alone places him there. God be merciful to me, a sinner. He is not trusting in himself that he is righteous because the conviction of God has shown him he is not righteous. The Pharisees think of others as sinners. The tax collector think of himself as a sinner. Look at verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For anyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Look at the phrase, I tell you, this is the voice of authority. Jesus, the Son of God, make the declaration, I tell you. The man who saw his depravity was the one who Jesus declared to be right before God. The one who saw himself as righteous and saw everyone else sin was the one who was not justified. Do we all understand what it means to, not to be justified? It means that the Pharisee is going to hell. It means that this deeply religious man is headed straight to hell. I pray that we always place ourselves in the arena of God's mercy and His grace, like the tax collector who was cut to the heart because of his sin. No matter how long we have been Christians, always remember that it is Christ alone. Now, it is important that we foster a life that is growing in faith and growing in Christ likeness. We must turn from sin and strive to live a holy life. However, all the time, we must rely on Christ. And never think that we have achieved enough righteousness to trust in ourselves. The sin that Jesus warned us about is the sin of self-righteousness. As believers, when we become more like Christ-like, there is a danger of trusting in ourselves. The life that Christ commands to us is a life of always realizing that we need Christ for everything from the beginning to the end. It is always Christ, Christ, and Christ. The true cure for self-righteousness is self-knowledge. Once we allow our understanding be open to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life and allow the Holy Spirit to control and transform us, we will talk no more of our goodness. We will talk no more of how good we are. In humanity, my brothers and sisters, live our life dependent on God's mercy, not dependent on our righteousness. Today, let us, as we leave this church, 
be encouraged at the promise that Christ ministers to all who see their sin and run to Him for mercy. Our prayers may not seem may seem weak at times, but remember this. Remember the prayer of the tax collector. He said this, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let us pray. Let us just pause and just allow the Word of God to speak to our hearts and minister to us. And allow the Holy Spirit to show us is there any areas in our life that we have fallen short of His glory where sometimes we may you know, make comments or even look down on others whose spiritual life are not doing that well. Or there, are many, or there are times where we see ourselves better than others. Let us make right before God so that we can come before the holy table clean and pure. Father well, God, we ask that, Lord, that you will strengthen us in our Christian walk with you. Remove in us gesture of self-righteousness. Because, Lord, as this passage reminded us, Lord, that it can lead us to condemnations. Remove the Pharisees in us and make us lowly as you are. Instill in our hearts the suffering you make for us on the cross that we may not boast anything before you and before our friends. Father, Lord God, we pray, Lord, you will forgive us for our self-righteousness for those times when we look down on others because we think we are somehow more, somehow we think that they, no, they, they are somehow more in need of God's grace than we are. So help us see our own sin before we address the sin of others. Also, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you constantly, your Spirit will constantly remind us how desperately we need your grace. May we always live humbly according to your holy teaching in the Bible and seek your grace and mercy all the time. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us rise as we affirm our faith in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, to him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to, the, to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Church, let us remain standing and uh, share our peace with one another. 
We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we are baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all the mix for peace and build our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.